Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, September the 14th. Today is the Feast of the Holy Cross, the day when the Church recognizes Holy Cross Day, and we'll talk about that a little more later on. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning, for my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it is also gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares, those who seek my hurt speak of ruin, and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man, I do not hear, like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord my God, who will answer. For I said, Only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. New Testament reading tonight is from Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. One of the earliest annual celebrations of the Church, Holy Cross Day, traditionally commemorated the discovery of the original cross of Jesus on September the 14th, 320 AD in Jerusalem. The cross was found by Helena, mother of Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. In conjunction with the dedication of a basilica at the site of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, the festival day was made official by order of Constantine in A.D. 335. A devout Christian, Helena had helped locate and authenticate many sites related to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus throughout biblical lands. Holy Cross Day has remained popular in both Eastern and Western Christianity. Many Lutheran parishes have chosen to use Holy Cross as the name of their congregation. 
Our Book of Concord reading tonight is a continuation of Article 5 from the Apology, uh, picking up in paragraph 148. Therefore, in all our praising of works and in the preaching of the law, let us keep this rule. The law is not kept without Christ. As he himself has said, apart from me you can do nothing, likewise, without faith it is impossible to please God. For it is very certain that the doctrine of the law is not intended to remove the gospel and to remove Christ as the atoning sacrifice. Let the Pharisees, our adversaries, be cursed. They interpret the law to assign Christ's glory to works. In other words, they say works are an atoning sacrifice, that they merit the forgiveness of sins. Works are always rightly praised in this way. They are pleasing because of faith. For works do not please without Christ as the atoning sacrifice. Through him we have also obtained access to God, Romans 5.2, not by works without Christ as mediator. Therefore, when it is said in Matthew 19.17, if you would enter life, keep the commandments, we must believe that without Christ the commandments are not kept and cannot please. So in the Decalogue itself, in the first commandment, the most liberal promise of the law is added, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, verse 6. But this law is not kept without Christ. For it always accuses the conscience that does not satisfy the law. Therefore the conscience flies in terror from the law's judgment and punishment. For the law works anger. Romans 4.15 A person keeps the law when he hears that for Christ's sake God is reconciled to us, even though we cannot satisfy the law. When Christ is apprehended as mediator through this faith, the heart finds rest and begins to love God and to keep the law. It knows that now, because of Christ as mediator, it is pleasing to God, even though the incomplete fulfilling of the law is far from perfection and is very impure. We must conclude this about the preaching of repentance. For although the scholastics have said nothing at all about faith in the doctrine of repentance, Yet we think that none of our adversaries is so mad as to deny that absolution is a voice of the gospel. And absolution ought to be received through faith in order that it may comfort the terrified conscience. The doctrine of repentance, because it not only commands new works, but also promises the forgiveness of sins, necessarily requires faith. The forgiveness of sins is not received unless through faith. Therefore, in those passages that refer to repentance, we should always understand that not only works, but also faith is required. For example, example Matthew 6.14 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Here a work is required, and the promise of the forgiveness of sins is added. This does not happen because of the work, but through faith, because of Christ, just as Scripture testifies in many passages. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 10.43 Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. 1 John 2.12 We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Ephesians 1.7 What need is there to recite testimonies? This is the very voice unique to the gospel, namely that for Christ's sake and not for the sake of our works, we obtain the forgiveness of sins through faith. Our adversaries work to suppress this voice of the gospel by means of distorted passages, which contain the doctrine of the law or of works. It is true that in the doctrine of repentance, works are required because certainly a new life is required. But here the adversaries wrongly add that by such works we merit the forgiveness of sins or justification. Christ often connects the promise of the forgiveness of sins to good works, yet not because he means that good works are an atoning sacrifice, for they follow reconciliation. Christ makes this connection for two reasons. One is because good fruit must necessarily follow. He reminds us that if good fruit do not follow, the repentance is hypocritical and fake. The other reason is that we have need of outward signs of so great a promise. A conscience full of fear has need of much consolation. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are signs that continually remind, cheer, and encourage despairing minds to believe more firmly that their sins are forgiven. So the same promise is written and portrayed in good works, in order that these works may remind us to believe more firmly. 
Those who produce no good works do not encourage themselves to believe, but despise these promises. On the other hand, the godly embrace them and rejoice that they have the signs and testimonies of so great a promise. So they exercise themselves in these signs and testimonies. Therefore, just as the Lord's Supper does not justify us by the outward act, ex opere operato, without faith, so alms do not justify us by the outward act, ex opere operato, without faith. The address of Tobit 4.11 ought to be received this way also. Uh, the book of Tobit is one of the books of the Apocrypha. Uh, it is also one of the books that Luther preached from. Uh, he said those books were good to read, and he meant to read in church, not just read on your own. The address of Tobit 4.11 ought to be received this way also, alms free from every sin and from death. We will not say that this is an exaggeration, although we should see it that way so that we do not detract from the praise of Christ, whose right it is to, be, to free from sin and death. But we must come back to the rule that without Christ, the doctrine of the law is of no profit. Therefore, those alms please God that follow reconciliation or justification, and not those that come before. They do not free from sin and death by the outward act, ex opere operato. As we have said above about repentance, we ought to embrace faith and its fruit. So here we must say about alms that this entire newness of life saves. Alms also are exercises of faith which receives the forgiveness of sins and overcomes death while it exercises itself more and more, and in these exercises receives strength. We grant also this, that alms merit many favors from God, lessen punishments, and merit our defense in the dangers of sins and of death, as we have said a little before about the entire repentance. Tobit's address, regarded as a whole, shows that faith is required before alms. Be mindful of the Lord your God all your days. Tobit 4.5. Afterward, bless the Lord your God always in desire of him that your ways be directed by him. Tobit 4.19. This, however, belongs properly to that faith which believes that God is reconciled to it because of his mercy, and which wishes to be justified, sanctified, and governed by God. But our adversaries, charming men, pick out mutilated sentences in order to deceive those who are unskilled. Afterward, they attach something from their own opinions. Therefore, entire passages are to be required. According to the common rule, it is inappropriate, before the entire law is thoroughly examined, to judge or reply when any single clause of it is presented. When produced in their entirety, passages very frequently bring the interpretation with them. Luke 11.41 is also cited in a mutilated form, namely, but give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. The adversaries are very stupid. Time and again, we have said that the gospel about Christ should be added to the preaching of the law. Because of Christ, good works are pleasing. But our adversaries teach everywhere that, Christ being excluded, justification is merited by works of the law. When this passage is produced unmutilated, it will show that faith is required. Christ rebukes the Pharisees who think that they are cleansed before God, that is, they are justified by frequent bathings. This is just as some pope or other who says that holy water sanctifies and cleanses the people, and the gloss says that it cleanses from venial sins. Such also were the opinions of the Pharisees that Christ rebuked. Against this phony cleansing, he sets up a double cleanness, one inward, the other outward. He bids them be cleansed inwardly, and adds concerning the outward cleanness, but give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. The adversaries do not rightly apply the phrase everything, for Christ adds this conclusion to both parts. All things will be clean unto you if you will be clean within, and will outwardly give alms. He shows that outward cleanness is to be connected to works commanded by God and not to human traditions. These traditions were the bathings held at that time, like the daily sprinkling of water. The clothing of monks, the distinctions of food, and similar pompous acts appear this way to us now. But the adversaries distort the meaning by transferring the universal phrase to only one part, like the sophists. All things will be clean to those having given alms, yet Peter says in Acts 15.9, having cleansed their hearts by faith. 
When this entire passage is examined, it presents a meaning harmonizing with the rest of Scripture. If the hearts are cleansed and then outwardly alms are added, i.e. all the works of love, they are entirely clean, i.e. not only within but also without. Why is not Christ's entire speech added to it? There are many parts of the rebuke, some of which give commandments about faith and others about works. It is not the place of an honest reader to pick out the commands about works, while the passages about faith are skipped. Last, readers are to be reminded of this. The adversaries give the worst advice to godly consciences when they teach that the forgiveness of sins is earned by works. Conscience, in seeking forgiveness through works, cannot be confident that the work will satisfy God. It is always tormented and continually invents other works and other acts of worship until it completely despairs. This course is described by Paul in Romans 4.5. There he proves that the promise of righteousness is not obtained because of our works. We could never affirm that we had a reconciled God, for the law always accuses. So the promise would be in vain and uncertain. He concludes that this promise of the forgiveness of sins and of righteousness is received through faith, not because of works. This is Paul's true, simple, and genuine meaning. In it, the greatest consolation is offered to godly consciences, and Christ's glory is shown forth. He certainly was given to us for this purpose, purpose, namely, that through him we might have grace, righteousness, and peace. And we will continue in that vein tomorrow evening. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers, bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian Church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the Church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole Church with the power and proof of the Holy Faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations, and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you, and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you, for the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Merciful God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross that he might bear the sins of the world and draw all people to himself. Grant that we who glory in his death for our redemption may faithfully heed his call to bear the cross and follow him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.